I am so excited about this week's episode. I am joined by Dr. Emily Wilson of Pelvic Wisdom to talk about emotions and their connection to symptoms we may be experiencing in our pelvic function. Our culture doesn't provide a safe container for anybody to have emotions. As women, we're not allowed to be angry. We are shamed or ridiculed if we cry. Our emotions are heightened in a lot of cases just before our cycles, and there are lots of experiences with how our environment conditions our emotions that lead to pelvic and other health issues if not properly expressed or acknowledged. Dr. Emily Wilson shares her wisdom as an allopathic practitioner who really bridges the gap in her work between manual care and the care of the energetic and spiritual body in the treatment of the whole person. Hi, I'm Adrienne Irizarry. I'm an Eastern medicine practitioner who is passionate about women's health and helping women live their best lives. My goal is to put you in the driver's seat of your menstrual health, offering period solutions for a symptom-free life. Statements made in this program are for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitution for medical consultation or advice. We do not claim to diagnose, treat, or cure any diseases. This podcast is inclusive and welcomes all gender identities. The focus of the program is on biological function, and we will use the term women throughout, but it is referencing physiological and social challenges for biology, not identity. Come as you are. I am happy you're here and welcome all performances of identity. I hope you find something helpful in this show. Welcome back to another episode of the Reproductive Rebel Podcast. I have been so excited about this episode because I am being joined by the very talented Dr. Emily Wilson. She is a pelvic floor physical therapist, but she is an allopathic practitioner that pulls in the energetic and spiritual body of the person into her work which I think is beautiful on so many levels. So thank you so much, Emily, for joining me on the show today. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here, Adrienne. It's so great to catch up with you and be doing this. So Emily and I crossed paths pretty close to a year ago, and I became completely enamored with the way that she does her work because something that I find quite often is in allopathic medicine, we pull apart the emotional body, the physical body, and the spiritual body. And so, you know, for people, for example, who are going in for a surgery, sometimes they might not choose the surgeon that has like the top skills or or surgical numbers or whatever, but they choose the doctor that makes them feel safe going into the procedure and that feeling of safety actually translates to a better outcome. So, you know, we deeply discount in our current medical model how the emotions show up in the body and how it can affect outcomes. And it's one of the things about Emily's work that I just think is so beautiful is she really does a deep dive when she works with people into this energetic and emotional space in terms of how that plays out in physical ways that the body shows up. So I know that's a that's a big intro, but tell us a little bit about your approach to working with people and really why it is so different. Yeah, um, it's definitely a different approach. As you said, I've come to come into my intuition a couple of years ago. And so when that happened, I really had the foundational black and white training, knew how the body worked, the structure, the physical. And then I was finding as I was uncovering my own kind of spiritual journey and being empathic and highly sensitive person that my body was holding things and I was sensing that other bodies were holding things. I could hold a spot and no, it just wasn't a physical issue. There was an undercurrent, be it grief, be it anger, be it sadness or a trauma stuck in the body or a limiting belief that we were holding. And so when I started to feel that undercurrent, 
luckily <laughs> I was being shown as well how to heal it. And then I developed those skills and kind of created and pulled from a couple different practitioners as well as downloaded my own information about how to address those underlying currents. And when I did that, like that root cause, that's when the muscles of the pelvic floor or wherever I was working on the body finally let go. And it's, that was like the missing piece. And I get so excited about it because then I can send people home who have been to multiple practitioners through town and they're not getting better. And they're using, let's say like dilators to constantly stretch or always having to do exercises to prepare for pain-free intercourse or even manageable intercourse. And I was sending them home without any, like they were done when they were done with me. Like it was permanent because we got to that root cause. And so that, that gets me so excited. <laughs> and that's kind of where I've been developing and continuing that practice and making it my own. Well, and that's what makes me so excited about your work, because in the work that I do as a peristeam hydrotherapist and even a sound healer, like I see this a lot every day in my practice that physical symptoms will show up in emotional ways and vice versa. Like people who will come in and they're like, oh, you know, I just had this big traumatic thing happen to me and they're very flat about it. But then they're talking about what's going on in their system and they're like, yeah, I, I've been having this issue with my digestion. And it's like, oh, I can imagine because you're shoving this down inside your body and it'll only go so far before the body goes, ah, I have to do something. It's like coiling a spring and having all of that energy in the system and it's got to go somewhere. Steaming helps to release that in a really beautiful way because of the acupuncture points. You're getting a lot of circulation in an area where women tend to store a lot of their stuff because it's the seat of their identity. Your womb space is, you are a creatrix, right? And you create, like maybe it's not giving birth and giving life, but creating a business, creating something that brings you a lot of joy, creating the life that you have for yourself. Like you create from this space that you also stuff a lot of stuff into this space and it will show up. You were talking about painful intercourse. That's one that I see an awful lot as well. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> this, I don't know if this is as eloquent as a analogy but I always think of I love how you said the seat of a woman and her identity but I always think of it like a junk room <laughs> like when it's not 3d printing a baby and being super creative or kind of manifesting your dreams and, and growing into your life that you want we can hold a lot and I think being sometimes the matriarch of a household or just around friends and family. We are just sensitive and we pick up a little bit more, especially myself, a little more porous. And it's almost like all this junk, my own traumas, mm -hmm. my own limiting beliefs from this lifetime, from other lifetimes, but also from other people around me gets the sense of heaviness in the pelvis, the junk room. It's like the room you throw the shit in and you hope no one opens the door. <laughs> and then I come in, I'm like, well, we're going to open the door today. <laughs> And we just start unwinding and moving some of the junk so that you can get back to that creatrix, that energy of creation, that like brilliance of the root of the the woman or the, the body, the female body. I love that you described it as the junk room. You know, I think I've actually used the closet, that closet that you stuff yeah. things into and nobody wants to open the door because they know that the pile of stuff is going to fall out on top of them. I mean, that analogy. So I love the junk room analogy because it's so true and it shows mm -hmm. up in menstrual function. I see yes. it in women all the time, like where they have lots of brown blood, they have lots of cramping, all this stuff. And, you know, when I work with people, sometimes they're really shocked that we spend maybe 2% of the appointment talking about what their period did and the rest of it talking about what's going on in their life. Yeah. And it, but that conversation, the next one we have, man, does that period look a lot healthier? And a lot of times it's just being heard, being seen, having that space held for their lived experience. 
because maybe they don't have a place for that in their day to day. They don't have a trusted person or they haven't had a good history with having trusted people to have those kinds of conversations with. And so, you know, I'll tell people like, I'm not trained as a therapist. However, I am a place for you to unpack some of that closet. And steaming helps to also unpack that closet because one of the acupuncture points that gets stimulated during this process has a lot to do with emotions. And so when you're allowing that release to come from the seat of the whole system, you know, I've had clients describe it almost like having bugs crawling in their system and it's super uncomfortable. I've had a couple of people say that like, they're not generally anxious people. And all of a sudden in their first couple of steam sessions, they feel really anxious. But then once the system unwinds that tension, they are able to enjoy the relaxing aspects of sitting and steaming. Do you see stuff like that in your practice as well? Yeah, I do. And I see a lot of people that walk in. And this is hard to explain, but I think you'll get it. And so hopefully I can paint a good picture. But they come in and they're really anxious. They're either in tears. They're like just kind of revved up in a way that it's hard for them to even sit still. But there's tears. There's emotions. There's like a, a bigness that they can't kind of hold within themselves. But there's also like a dissociation from the body of not feeling safe in their own bodies. They can't really land in the seat or in their body. Or the person that you said comes in like really flat and kind of can't, the color isn't there because they're not allowing themselves to experience or they're disassociated from it. So I see those two types of people come in and they don't necessarily know it's going to be somewhat intuitive driven work or they do. They knew what they signed up for. Um, <laughs> we start to get in there and we unwind and kind of, like you said, clean out the junk room, clear the stagnation of the pelvis. And we move through those anxieties. We move through those tensions. And sometimes they're childhood traumas. Sometimes they're limiting beliefs or things that they picked up as a teenager or through sexual experiences that didn't go the way they wanted to or surgeries or miscarriages or whatever is holding and heavy in the body. And it's beautiful. I watch these women every time they come back in, they look a little lighter. They're yeah. walking more confidently. Their posture changes. And they sit in the chair and there's like this energy. And we get to this point where I'm like, you're hiding your gift and it's time, bring it forward. And so that's where I take it a little bit deeper with the people who need it and are open to it. But it's like, you're intuitive or you're empathic. You have this gift and you need to share it with the world because you're holding it tight in your throat space, which is strongly connected to your womb space. And it's almost like that energy wants to come up and out of you to bring it into the world, to bring your gifts forward. Mm -hmm. And they start to dissolve some of the fear and the scarcity and the, the, the hiding. And then the last couple sessions, they come in and they're so bright and so vibrant and their aura is taking up more space and they have color in their cheeks and mm -hmm. they're just this unlayered of trauma most of it is what I think it's like we're pulling the trauma out of the body or moving it and resolving it and it's it's just fascinating they're like I'm a different person I'm like I know you look like a different person how do we how do we say that on a podcast but it's like there's a there's a different tone and a quality and a power to these patients as they walk out of my door for the last time and that just is my favorite part to watch that anxious to I can stand in my power in my body on my feet grounded mm -hmm. I see that and I know what you're talking about yeah. it's like watching a flower open mm -hmm. you know it's like that early stage of the bud being completely closed in on itself and mm -hmm. because it's come out of that bursting forth so it's like they're there because they know that there's something there for them Mm -hmm. But then as they go through the process, the flower opens wider and wider and wider. And, it, and you just get to see all the brilliance that the person is. I have a client who had been raised in an environment where they actually are an incredibly intuitive. And I actually think that this person has mediumship abilities and they had been raised in a container where that environment told them that they saw demons and that 
this was a bad thing. And this poor person had a lot of physical issues showing up in the body in a like a systemic kind of way as a result of the suppression of those gifts. And as they learned to not demonize themselves for the fact that this was showing up for them and they learn more about them. They learned it was actually more of a gift and it really wasn't the curse that they were led to believe that it was and all of these kinds of things like this particular client that she just she would bounce into the appointment and she had like more, you know, enthusiasm in her voice and her eyes were clearer and totally forgot some of the symptoms that she'd initially walked in and said, hey, can you help me with this? Because, you know, as we go back through and check in, I'm like, so how is this symptom? How is this symptom? And she's like, I never came to you for that. And it's like, actually, <laughs> actually, you did. The time. <laughs> but I love that, though, because there's so much embracing of this, like, oh, I feel better and I have more zest for life and I want to do this. And I, you know, now I'm I'm allowing myself to dream a little and you know, when my kids grow, maybe I want to do this or I'm thinking about a career change. Is that crazy? Like just these things, all of a sudden they're like really stepping into the truest form of who they are and the physical ailments, I'm going to call them, you know, the expressions of this emotional suppression start to fall away as it becomes more acceptable in their system, regardless of how the rest of their environment is handling the fact that they are transforming into a richer, more dynamic version of themselves, right? right? Because a lot of times once they get to that point, it's okay. They're like, oh, this person doesn't accept that I'm this way and that's okay. So talk a little bit about, just because I'm totally fascinated with the whole process, when you work with people, when you take them from that anxious state into this beautiful blooming flower, what does a typical like intake appointment look like with you? Do you get into the energetic side of it right out of the gate? Or is that something that you start a little more clinical and work into? It really depends on the person and how open they are to their own intuition or where they are at that journey of recognition of their more colorful side, as I call it. <laughs> and some people, you know, aren't, I'm not that person that is going to help them awaken it or they're here for a little bit more black and white, more structural things. And I'm just planting seeds, but people who are ready for it, it can come up pretty quick. And I, I kind of love those sessions where it's like, I could just show up but I really tailor it to the patient. But if they show up wanting that, that's going to come out from, it's going to reflect right back to them um, in the first session. What I love asking if people are ready and open is, is and a lot of times they just give me this because they know I work with trauma is what are your traumas, right? Like where, what are you holding? And it's like, oh, well, when I was a child, this happened and, and I'm still holding a lot of heaviness and grief here from, from this death in my life or I'm holding this. I'm holding this. I had a miscarriage or an abortion. I start writing kind of the energetics and ask them straight up, like, how, how did you feel? What were the emotions that you had around it then? What do you have around it now? Like how much work and how much processing have you done? And then as we get into an exam, I do a whole full external exam, really mapping out how much of like the abdominal connections down to the pelvis are pulling, how much from the legs just how the body's holding in, in almost every woman I treat. And you might have seen, you might see this too, or start noticing it. I see this like armor on the front of our body. This like, I have to be tough. I have to hold, I have to protect. And then what I see is this fascial band that lies between the hips, like where a belt would be hiding over the, or covering, <laughs> covering and hiding the womb space, the bladder and like the bowels and the ovaries in that area. And it's almost to me like we have to hold and protect and guard our valuable reproductive organs as women because of the world we live in right now. Mm -hmm. so I'm finding all these layers and kind of getting a story for what's happening through the digestive system and what's happening through the reproductive system and the body in general. But then if we have time and people are open, I tend to do a vaginal internal exam and start sensing into the muscles. And it's 
beautiful sometimes. I have patients where immediately I feel the density of the muscle is a more emotional and I have them help tune into it. And when they do, they kind of uncover a trauma. I used to be a little bit, what's the word? I don't know if upset is the word, but I've had people that I've been to who can channel and just see it and name it in a person. And I've come to discover what my gift is, as I use my abilities to open the space to bring a person deeper into meditation or into the ability to listen to their own body. So I use my medical intuition to help you sense into your body so that you can then use that tool after we're done, which I've come to think is, is even a greater gift. <laughs> so, and some people, if they're having a hard time pulling the information forward, I'll get some, some channeled information or some images or some like a, an emotion that kind of pops up that I can feel. But as they bring it forward, oh, this event happened when I was a teenager and yeah, this breakup and I didn't feel safe. And that's what their muscles holding. And then we start tuning into it and do a healing around that and the muscle relaxes. And I mean, to do that on the first day, it's brilliant. <laughs> and they're like, they're well on their way. We've cleared some of the junk room out, which clears the stagnation. So now they're just draining energy in a much better way. Energy that we want to drain. We'll put it that way. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Now, sometimes it starts day one. Sometimes it doesn't. I ease into it. It just depends on the person. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, too. <laughs> on a lot of levels, you know, from a, how often you see people, like, do you give them time to integrate some of this before you do another session? And, like, you schedule them based on essentially what they unpacked and the ahas that they took out of it, or you can see that they're trying to process that, you know, probably 24 to 48 hours after they walk out of the office, the aha is going to come. Right. I, I don't know about you, but like, I have those moments where like I send people out after Accutonics and I'm like, I guarantee you, I'm going to get a text message in like 24, 48 hours because they're going to be like, Oh, that's what's <laughs> going on. Right. So because the system sometimes has to take all of that input, especially if it's new input, right. um, like with sound therapy, I see that all the time. Like this is just a new way of communicating with the body for a lot of people. Some people have had sound therapy done, but for the most part, it's a fairly new way of communicating with the body for the system to like take that information and start doing things with. So when you work with people, do you find that you meet with them like on a weekly basis or do you give them bigger stretches in between to actually integrate and do some work on their own before they come back so that each session with you, they make more progress? Yeah, I would say uh, the rhythm that I'm like finding and, and really enjoying is I'm seeing people a little bit more with like the structural black and white stuff at one one hour a week for a few weeks and making sure we have the armoring off and we have the body soft and we're not pulling on the pelvic floor or the bladder or the womb as much. And then as we get to the more energetic work, I tend to space it out every other week. And that seems like good processing time. Some people need a little bit more and some people are just so ready and they've been waiting to unlock this world that they're ready to do it once a week. Um, yeah. And I, I typically suggest kind of taking some time and journaling and kind of writing it down can help process. But yeah, it just really depends on the person. And sometimes I will kind of space out a little bit more if we need to. Yeah, I can see that. I generally don't see people more than once a week for agutonics for the same reason because they, their body literally needs time even when they're hungry for it i had experience with having people come in like spaced out but a couple times in the same week and it was like too much for their system because sometimes these types of issues have just been packed away or they've been in the back of that junk closet for such a long period of time Right. That, you know, you have to get over feelings of fear in order to even bring them forward. And you may not even have the words for it. You just know that you feel and, and this is the word that I hear with my clients a lot is I just feel stuck and I'm not mm -hmm. sure why. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I think this work, as we talk about the layer and the blossom, that kind of unwinding, they don't realize, most of the times patients don't realize how interconnected in so many pieces of their life it is. And so those synchronicities start to kind of unwind themselves and then they're they're not realizing their relationship is shifting because of the work they did for their pelvic pain. And so <laughs> no, and those kind of kind of connections come back and they're kind of fun and juicy to hear about how synchronous it was. Oh yeah. I've had a few of those clients who have been like, yeah, like we just weren't on the same page. I was pretty convinced that we were like headed for a divorce. And, you know, they're like a month, maybe two into steaming. And they'll open the conversation with something along the lines of, and we are talking and we're not fighting as much and, you know, that kind of thing. And it's like, wow, like you're doing this work for this physical symptom that because a lot of times that's what brings people into practitioners like us. Right. And I hear this from chiropractic colleagues, too. They're like somebody comes in for their shoulder pain. And then by the time they get like so far down the road and the chiropractor goes back and goes, hey, how is that shoulder pain? And they're like, oh, you know, I, I didn't come to you for shoulder pain, kind of like that lady that I was talking about before. But because what they're focused on is my sleep is better. My ability to handle stress is better. My ability to interact with people around me, like I'm not so quick to sh be sharp with people. Like, do you see those kinds of things in your practice as well? Yeah, definitely where it's like I have to scroll back because we both forget what the initial complaint was because there's just so much further that we've taken it and uncovered in the body. And yeah, those old things are old. And <laughs> that is a different version of them that has died. And they are now on to this future version of themselves. I love how you worded that, too, because that's really what it becomes. Because one thing that, that in our culture, like we just stuff our emotions down. And our emotions are what make us dynamic and beautiful as humans. And culturally, like we just don't allow for emotions to happen. People aren't allowed to be angry. They aren't allowed to cry. They're not allowed to be frustrated, especially when you are either assigned at birth female or you identify as female. Anytime female enters into the equation, there is this understanding that you're supposed to be demure and your voice is not the most dominant one in the conversation. Like I looked at all the rhetoric. This is my master's in communication talking, right? But I looked at all the rhetoric around the vice presidential debate. And this is not a political conversation in any way. This is actually identifying how our culture looks at women's voices. But, you know, Kamala Harris could say the exact same thing that Pence did. However, everything she said, she had to finish with a smile because in our culture, women are supposed to be demure and pleasant. And if we are confident and articulate, sometimes we get labeled with nasty labels like they are abrasive or they are a bitch or I've been called brisk before and I'm like, no, I just know my mind. I've made a decision and because I'm doing this from a masculine energy place, now I get a nasty label. So we internalize all of this stuff and very early on in my career, because I spent the first 15 years of my life working in more of a, a communication setting and a lot of that actually drove me into this. That's a long story for another day. But I will never forget my first job out of college. I was a copywriter or started in copywriting and made some transitions. I had written this piece for an organization and the AVP of that organization sat on the corner of my desk, slid the draft back to me and said, in this industry, if you are going to survive as a female, you think you believe, you know, you never feel. And she walked out of my cube. And that hit me really hard. And I looked at the paper. And of course, you know, anyone who in the who's listening to this who is creative, 
even if that had been delivered in a very constructive criticism kind of way, would have been a little salty having their artistic work turned back to them, right? So I'm sitting there, I'm trying not to get salty about it. And I'm like looking at this paper going, what is wrong with it? It's grammatically correct. Structure is good. It's the same. Like I'm going through all of the positive things about it. And then all of a sudden the word popped off the page. I put the word feel in there a few times. I had written it feminine voice and I didn't even realize I had done it. And so I spent the first 10 years of my career with a lot of writing in my background, thinking, believing, and knowing. And, you know, Ghost wrote speeches for both men and women, right? Everything, think, believe, know, feel never came into it. And I realized as I went along through my life, not feeling anything, because that's what was, quote unquote, setting me up for success, which I look back on now and realize is a complete bunch of bullshit. But as a young person, right, you're trying to build a career for yourself. You're trying to build an image and a name for yourself. And in doing that, I literally made poor choices about partners I was with, the way I presented myself in the world. Like I had become completely disconnected from my intuitive body, from the fact that I felt anything. Right. And man, did my period show it. Right. So we go back to that and the armoring, like no wonder we're armoring and having to create this like stony or this hardness, which is protective. But are we receiving the love and, and all of that that we want to receive as much as we are we as open to it? Probably not because we're having to hold such structure and protection around our heart space and around our womb space absolutely tell me i want to talk about the junk closet (laughs) love this junk closet idea because that's how i see it in my work too so speak a little bit to the junk closet and how you see people taking that emotional body that feeling body Mm -hmm. and stowing it away in this junk closet and the kinds of physiological things that you see show up Mm -hmm. so that, you know, as people are listening to this, they might, you know, maybe they've been struggling with X, Y, or Z symptom for a long time and maybe didn't even make the connection that there could be an emotional component to it. Because again, in our Western culture, we tend to put things in silos, right? Your lungs are over here. You know, you've got a doctor that deals with your throat. You've got a doctor that deals with your feet. Like, it's just all separated. And that's just the physical body alone, the emotional (laughs) side of things, right? So talk a little bit about that. It's a little different for every person, right? And I think what's happening, because I can see someone's, we'll go off, off segment for a second, but I can see a pelvic floor that feels the same amount of tension and the same amount of dysfunction as another with the muscles where I'm touching. It feels the same. And person A has pelvic pain. They can't have intercourse because it's so bad. They have painful periods. And let's say they, they leak urine. Whereas person B really doesn't have any symptoms, but they have the same like muscular tension amount uh-huh. and intensity. Or let's say they have they have fecal incontinence instead, person B, but they have none of the other symptoms, but it's literally the muscles are tight in the same place. And I think what's happening is two parts. So the body picks the symptom that you're going to listen to the most, the most annoying, the thing that's going to like poke you the most to go in and get therapy. (laughs) And the second being that it's also might be part of the lesson and what you're holding. So I think it's like kind of a two part and I kind of work through that. So it could really be a breath of symptoms through the pelvic floor or a tension or a holding pattern. And it's really like reteaching you how to sense into your body and how to sense into your emotions. That's a language we're not taught in school. And Mm -hmm. like you said, we're not taught to feel emotions at all. So 
part of my work is just sensing into the body and asking the patient to sense in as I push this muscle, what comes up for you? And maybe they see an image or a color or they have a feeling of, let's say, constriction in the throat or a heaviness in the solar plexus or the heart area. And then I'm like, okay, what's it look like or what does it feel like? And we just start learning how to name what something looks or feels like in the body with an emotion because that was untaught. <laughs> And a lot of times when we're not feeling or we're compressing or just shoving down in the junk room, you kind of have a default of either you are allowed as a kid to be angry, but not sad. And so your go-to emotion is anger or the opposite, like don't be angry. That's not what women do or or anyone in general. Men men are taught that too. So your go-to is sadness. And so this is what I learned recently, and it's fascinating to me. Whatever your default is, anger or sadness, if you sink underneath it, you probably have the opposite emotion right under, but you were repressing it because your childhood taught you to, or something in your life, a past past experience taught you to express the one that wasn't allowed to happen. And so we can sense into these undercurrents and then really start unwinding, where did this start happening in childhood? Was there something that Let's say your mother didn't allow you to cry or let's say your father didn't like when you were angry. And so then we go back and we could do some inner child work to release this from the body and release the way that your body's remembered this trauma or these, let's even call them a micro trauma, right? I think trauma is a word we're not using enough. I think we have more trauma than we think. It doesn't have to be extreme. Mm Mm-hmm. So we unwind the way the body experiences it and then the muscle relaxes and the person isn't feeling this kind of undercurrent of that emotion anymore in their body. Oh, that is so beautiful. And I agree with you. When we say the word trauma, a lot of times we think big T trauma, Mm -hmm. but there can be a lot of little T trauma that just adds up. It's more junk in the junk room. Yeah, yeah. To the point where like, it concerns me a bit when someone says they have not, no trauma because we've all had some trauma. Be human in this world, in this life, there is trauma. And there is, on the other side of that, joy and beauty, right? Like grief, trauma, heaviness. But then it gets juxtaposed with this duality of the beauty of life. And I think that really helps us feel the spectrum of emotions and of experiences and of love and the depth of love in our life. I agree. It was as you were talking about, you know, and and I think that's fascinating, the idea that the way that you respond, that the the opposing emotion is like laying latent under the surface, that actually makes a lot of sense, may take that gem into my practice. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I love that. It made me think, though, too, about how many of us were told as a kid to be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm especially if you are female, to be seen and not heard, and that there's a lot to do with voice Mm -hmm. for women or lack of voice or feeling like they're safe enough to have their voices heard. Yeah, yeah. So uh, patterns that I see all the time are people-pleasing because Mm -hmm. it's safer to be small and agreeable and not ruffle feathers. That's a response, a trauma response typically. But then also, yeah, the voice. And we should talk about how intimately connected the voice and the womb and the throat, like all of that is connected. And you'll see a lot of pictures or articles people have done, and they show a picture of the womb and the cervix and the the, uh, vaginal canal in conjunction with how the throat looks. And there's so many anatomy kind of mirrors between the two. They're both diaphragms of some sort. There's a fascial connection between the two because when you're born embryology or before you were born, as you were developing, the throat and the womb grew apart from each other. So they actually stretched fascially away from each other, meaning they have connection. (laughs) Wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> trying to look at that like an embryology level, there's connection. But then we talk about the vagus nerve. It runs from the space of the brain through the throat, through down all of our special organs. Like it's very crucial in our work. But then it ends. One of the spots of where a branch of the vagus nerve terminates is the cervix. 
No one talks about that. No anatomy book talks. No, no medical book even mentions, barely mentions the cervix, let alone that part of the vagus nerve terminates there. And so we think about how all of these connections kind of attach. I start theorizing if we're not speaking our truth, that we've come here in this world to speak, whatever gift it is, whatever truth you have to share, the womb kind of shuts down too, because I've found this is this will take us into another tangent that would be beautiful that I used to think that source energy and everything was outside of me. My intuition was messages that came from outside. And I, I think there is some of that. But then I found the womb space and journeyed and created work around the richness and the depth and the ancestral. And every woman that's come before us has this wisdom that's been packed into our wombs waiting for us to kind of uncover and sense into and live by. And when we learn how to communicate to the womb and she can guide us, it's almost like that energy comes up through the womb, up through our throat and out into the world to be shared with others, to be lighting up other people in our life. And when that isn't happening, because no one's taught us and then we've repressed it all because of people pleasing and it's not safe to use your voice and don't be seen. We're seeing a lot of issues, not only in the womb space, and I'm sure you're seeing it in the expression of periods, and I'm seeing it in the expression of pain or tension or all the issues in the womb. There's a lot. I won't, I won't mention them all. But then I'm also seeing it in people having throat issues, thyroid issues, trouble speaking their truth, like their voice, like they feel like they have a frog in their throat or there's some kind of throat pain or they can't wear necklaces because it makes them gag or makes them feel funny. And so there's just this duality between the two. And I think it's really important to notice how they're connected and explain it. Because when I see people healing it and finally coming into that truth and letting it flow through their throat space and out into the world, both issues clear up. <laughs> and they're that bright, shining, unlayered, blossomed person who you wouldn't recognize when they first walked in the door to where they are now. Oh, I feel so seen right now. Oh, oh for you. How many other people listening resonate with that? I know that I do. And whenever I try to embark on things that scare me at some level, my voice tends to disappear. I start sounding like I have laryngitis. And well, you probably can hear a little bit of it in my voice today. Some of that is actually coming out of grief. Do you find that women lose that connection with their voice? Because grief can be different things. Grief. Mm -hmm be, in my case, I just lost the matriarch in my family on my father's side, and she had a huge hand in raising me. So like when we think of grief, we think of that, right? But the way that you just described that connection, grief can be more of an identity related thing as well. Right. Maybe it's not even a grief we can identify right until we've already solved it, right? And then it's like, Oh, I was grieving that I wasn't showing up authentically or letting myself just be. Or, you know, I see this a lot too. I have strong feelings that we used to be raised in more tribal mentalities and we very much individualized to the nuclear family. And it's less and less networked and less and less involved than it used to be just by the way the world is, especially in America. And there can be, and I see this theme in a lot of new moms that I treat, this underlying grief that they can't name, that there's no community around them. There's no network. There's no many aunties, many uncles, many that like that fullness of the family isn't there. And it's this grief that pulls through the body that they can't name. And I, I say, do you think like there's a lack of community here? Is that the grief you're feeling? And then the tears come up and it wasn't something they even knew because it was this ancestral way of living that's been lost. And so we have to put names to, yeah, these griefs that sometimes you don't realize until you're like already in them or past them. Mm hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. It makes me think of a couple of my postpartum clients. And, and that's what it is too, a grief and sometimes anxiety around that grief as well, because they're not sure where that support is going to come from. And they're so tired, they can't figure it out. Poor right. thing. <laughs> right. 
I started a grief group this year, a grief circle, and I co-host it with a friend. So I've been thinking about the idea of grief a lot. And we go and we sit in a circle and we all talk about things that we're grieving, whatever it is. Everyone's open to share whatever they feel like is holding grief in their body. And they have the time to share uninterrupted. And then we go around person to person to person. And then at the end of all the sharing, when people have felt heard and seen and had space, then we, oh, I resonate with that. That makes so much sense. I'm so glad you said that. I'm grieving that too as a mother. I also have understood what it's like to watch a mother get very ill with Alzheimer's. This is really beautiful, open conversation. And then after that, we step into a meditation that I create each time. And it's helping people understand how to feel grief in their body. What does it look like? Sometimes it looks like a deep kind of dark blob in the body or like a dark shadow or a box or a rock that's heavy. And we can start to kind of chisel away at it or sweep it away or move some of that energy. But one of the most interesting pieces from that that I sat with and understood was grief feels like a tingle ball of yarn of many emotions. So I feel sadness in there. I feel anger. I feel sometimes resentment. It depends on what the exact grief is, but it feels really messy and it feels really tangled. And because of that, it feels so dense. And I've started to learn that we could just start to separate the ball of yarn and say, this is the sadness part of it. This is the anger part of it. This is maybe the depth of love that lays under the grief and why I felt such grief. And when we start to lay them out in individual rows instead of a tangled barn of yarn, they they feel so much more manageable. And I Mm -hmm. really love that idea of untangling grief and starting to get it to know it in a more intimate way to make it more easy to process. And I can't tell you enough how exciting this group has been to, one, create community out of the heaviness of grief. That just blows my mind. I never thought we would all feel like so good after leaving every group, having somewhat been heard and processed grief and moved through it and get somewhat of a deeper understanding in our body And I really just created it because I didn't want people coming into me years later because of unprocessed grief. Like, let me treat, let me teach them the tools to do it now by themselves or with a group of of other people so that it's not sitting as a stagnant energy and then something that's causing pelvic dysfunction or pain. Oh, I love that. I love that we don't talk about grief enough. Yeah. Yeah. We really don't. And there needs to be places, safe spaces like that to talk about grief. I released a podcast in the last season, actually, it was called Grief and Pregnancy Loss, to talk about this topic simply because we don't talk about it enough. And not just in conjunction with pregnancy loss, although I do see a lot of shame in women that is unresolved processing of grief, but a lot of shame around miscarriage, stillbirth, because it has to do with our fundamental function as a woman, like, and having that not happen as we anticipate or as we believe it would or should or anything like that. When it doesn't play out that way, there's a trauma in that, but then there's a shame in the fact that you're not able to execute as well as the grief over loss. And all of that can really stand in the way when people are thinking about trying to conceive again and things of that nature. And so I I can tell you from that podcast, which was super raw recording, but I had so much pent up energy in my body doing it. I had to walk while recording because just I had to move it through my system. Yeah. But there are so many people who don't. And you're right. And I think it's so beautiful the way that you unpacked that, that it does. It feels so dense. And sometimes we feel shame around how some of those emotions are coming up too, because it's like when I lost my daughter a year ago, October, I was angry. I was really angry and I felt a lot of shame around feeling angry. Yeah. 
And that sat with me for a long time. And I didn't feel like it was okay to be angry about it. It's like, well, this is just means that there was a bigger plan. Adrian, you need to like get right with the fact that this is the outcome. And yet there was so much anger in that density. And so I beautifully worded my friend. And I, I'm so glad to know that there is a resource like yours. Now, this circle that you offer, is it only in person or is it virtual? So if any of my listening audience might be interested in an offering like that, that they could potentially participate because there aren't a lot of safe spaces for this kind of work. Yeah, right now it's in person in Portland, Maine area. It switches locations every now and then to give a little bit more accessibility throughout the greater Portland area. I don't know if it will go virtual one day. Right now there's a real call for in-person events and in-person healing after COVID, but open to the opportunity. I'll of course let you know if it morphs itself. Absolutely. If it morphs, I will make sure to update the show notes for this episode so that people can find you because this is a really beautiful offering. But, you know, if you are in the area of Portland, Maine, this is a really beautiful opportunity for healing. And this is also a great way to be like, so how would people find you, my friend? (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing about your experiences so openly. I really i am sending you love and appreciative that you're so open and honest with your listeners. Yeah. So to find me, yeah, my name is Dr. Emily Wilson, and I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist in Portland, Maine. You can find me on my website is pelvicwisdom.com. You can email me at pelvicwisdom at gmail.com or Instagram is pelvic underscore wisdom. Those are all my best places. <laughs> of Dr. Emily Wilson's contact information will be in the show notes for this episode. And if you are interested in learning more, she has incredible resources on her website. We also have a free listeners group on Facebook. So if you look at the Reproductive Rebel Podcast listeners group, join the conversation, share what you loved about this episode. And until next time, because I will absolutely be doing another episode with Emily, we're talking about actually going through my own journey using her incredible gifts to see how I can heal some of my own stuff. And I will be sharing every aspect of that journey with you. So until next time, thank you for listening to the Reproductive Rebel podcast. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Reproductive Rebel. Reproductive Rebel is recorded by certified peristeam hydrotherapist, herbalist, sound healer, and Chinese nutritional therapist, Adrian Irizari of Moon Essence, LLC. If you are interested in setting up an appointment with Adrian for one-on-one support, ordering from our store, or checking out our course offerings, visit our website at moonessence.life. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter to get insider information on upcoming events and offerings. Join the conversation. Like us and follow Moon Essence Me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Your voices make this program possible. Thank you all for your continued support.